David Kell, and welcome to my world. You may notice there's no backdrop today. Uh, the room's getting decorated, so this wall's just been plastered. It's going to get wallpapered, and then there's actually going to be no place for my backdrop, so probably going to have to record videos with uh, the wallpaper behind me in the future, but what does that really matter? Anyway, today I want to take a look and review one of my all-time favourite games ever. My second favourite game of all time, in fact, and my absolute favourite for the system it's on, that's the PlayStation 1. The game is Twisted Metal 2 World Tour. Let me take you back first to 1997. It's getting closer and closer to Christmas and my parents are asking me what I want. And well, the M64 is out. I grew up with Nintendo consoles. Started with the NES, got the SNES, now the N64 is out. Logically, I'm going to go for the N64. However, it was quite expensive. And the games were very expensive as well. And there was another console out of the market. It was cheaper used CD-ROM technology and was called the Sony PlayStation. So my parents basically convinced me that the Sony PlayStation was the better choice. The games were cheaper which meant I could get more games than what I would be able to on the N64. So yeah, as a kid I'm sold. I can buy more games for this system. Um, yeah, sure, whatever. I had no idea really about the PlayStation, I didn't really know much about any of the games at the time, I was just kind of sold on the fact it was cheaper. Now my brother on the other hand, his birthday is in November, and he did actually end up getting the N64. That was his console, all for himself, so the Sony PlayStation was going to be all mine. My very first ever, all to myself, console. So. That was really great. Plus, you know, we also had the N64 in the house, so I couldn't go wrong. And because the internet really wasn't very big in 1997, I mean, I personally didn't get the internet until 2002, and even then it was really terrible, shitty dial up. So, before the internet, in order to get news and things like that on video games, you bought magazines. Since I was getting the Sony PlayStation, I decided to pick up a few magazines before just to, you know, see what games were out for it, what I might want. There was one game in particular that caught my eye. I believe I have told this story before, both in video and in text form, so just bear with me for those that know it. One particular magazine, I think it was Planet PlayStation or PlayStation Planet, one of the two, it was the magazine that I got quite often back in the day. And it had the pictures of this game, and it was described as Super Mario 64 for the Sony PlayStation. And well, I, I was playing Super Mario 64 on the N64 because my brother had it. This game was touted as being the Super Mario 64 for the PlayStation, the system that I'm getting. Yeah, I want that game. That game was Croc, the Legend of the Gobbles. So that was the game that I wanted, and obviously um, console bundles were a huge thing back then, still are now. So come Christmas, you know, Christmas Day 1997, downstairs, ready to open up my PlayStation and hopefully play Gobbo Legend of the Gobble, Le uh, Gobbo Legend of the Gobbles, Croc Legend of the Gobbles. I'm so excited just thinking about it. Yeah, so my parents, you know, let me down before I opened it saying that, you know, unfortunately the croc bundle was out of stock, so they had to get me a different one, but it's okay because I get money for Christmas or family and things like that, so I'll just be able to buy it later. That's fine, you know, I'll still be able to get it, and until then I'll probably have some awesome games to play on the system straight away. So open it up, and there it was. The first game that I saw, the first game that I technically owned, I guess, the first game that I played on the system. This very system, by the way, this is, this is my original PlayStation from 1997. It's the oldest console that I own in terms of, you know, 
It's my original one. I have a NES and a SNES now, but they, they weren't the one to have back then. This is my PlayStation. So Twisted Metal 2 was the first game that I played on it. Um, there was also Destruction Derby 2, and then a third game that I can never remember. I do not remember what the game came in the bundle. So Twisted Metal 2 World Tour was the first game I played, and I was blown away by it. And to this day, it's remained one of my all-time favourite games. This is my original copy of it still, with my original system, both of which still work. The PlayStation's a bit iffy at reading discs sometimes, but I have absolutely no problems playing the actual disc on the PS2 or the PS3. Of course, we all know, I'm sure most of you know the story of Croc and how I did eventually get it. It was a huge disappointment, terrible and shitty, so I am unbelievably glad that fate somehow stepped in and gave me this wondrous, magnificent game in place of the pure shite that was Crop Legend of the Crackles. So, we've gone down memory lane and here I am now. It is 2016. Almost 20 years since I got this console in this game and I'm still playing it. I play it multiple times a year, despite all the new games that come out that I play and enjoy. You know, the Wii U has a fantastic library, despite what people might think. You know, there's still lots of really good new games coming out. Oh, well, not so much now for the Wii U, but there's still plenty of brand new games over the last few years that are well worth playing. And then, you know, I've been collecting other older consoles, the NES, the SNES, the N64 as well, lots of classic titles. And yet, I still go back to this over and over and over again, which is why I wanted to review this game because it is incredible, it needs to be talked about. So, let's get started with the review. Released in Japan in late 1996 and then early 1997 for Europe and the US, Twisted Metal 2 World Tour was obviously the sequel to Twisted Metal, developed by Single Track and published by Sony. The premise is simple. Calypso has the power to grant wishes and created a twisted metal competition in which the winner can ask for anything they desire. The first game was set just in LA, but now Calypso has decided to take the competition worldwide. Various individuals compete for the prize, all driving their own unique killing machines in hopes of being the last driver standing at the end. So basically just try and destroy everyone. And it is so much fun. The game features 12 drivers right off the bat with another two that you can unlock via cheat codes. And as well as each character having their own unique vehicle, they also have their own backstory which you can read on the character selection screen, which might just give you a hint as to what they will ask for as a prize should they win. First up is Roadkill. Driven by Marcus Kane, the roadkill vehicle looks like a, a standard car with mounted machine guns. And well, that is basically what it is, which shows in the car's armour only being 2 out of 5. Thankfully though, his speed and special weapon both being a 3 makes up for this a little. His special weapon sees a boomerang like missile fire out and then return to you. If the missile hits an opponent on the way back to your car, it will deal out three times the amount of damage. Very handy. As for his story, well, he seems to break the fourth wall and believes that this is all just fake, despite everyone thinking he's crazy. Next, we have Twister, driven by Amanda Watts. It's an F1 racing car designed for speed more than anything else giving you one of the fastest cars in the game combined with very tight controls to match. However, her armour is pitiful, only 1 out of 5, making Twister one of the more difficult vehicles to beat the game with. A special weapon is very strong with 4 out of 5, but involves getting close to opponents in order to spin them round in a crazy tornado spin, which can leave you more open to attacks. Amanda probably has the least interesting story, which is just her obsession with speed. Axel is next, and this is one crazy unique design for sure. 
in prison 20 years ago, Axel is stuck inside his own vehicle and in constant pain. His stats are pretty average across the board with average handling, slightly below average speed, average armour and special weapon. Likely a good choice for first timers to get used to the game in my opinion. His special weapon is really cool too, sending out a nuclear explosive shockwave which does more damage the closer an opponent is to him. Very useful for getting out of tight spots as it will lift opponents into the air and send them flying back a little. Axel is all about trying to gain the strength to confront the man that did this to him. Perhaps my favourite to play as a kid was Mr Slam, driven by Simon Whittlebone. Mr Slam is a JCB that does far more destruction than construction. While his speed is terrible, only 1 out of 5, and the handling is sluggish, his armour is 4 out of 5, and his special weapon is 5 out of 5. You do need to be very close to opponents to activate the special weapon, which lifts opponents up and down, smashing them numerous times, but being 5 out of 5 does a lot of damage. Most vehicles will only be able to take 3 or 4 of these before getting destroyed for good, and the grey armour does come in handy for getting close when you need to as well. Simon, the driver, is out for revenge after being fired during construction of a tower that was his dream. Only Calypso can give him his dream back, and he certainly has the tools to make it happen. We now move to a very creepy character, Mortimer, the driver of Shadow. He's essentially the undertaker of Twisted Metal, driving a hearse and dealing with souls. Shadow might only have average stats for the most part, but his special weapon is 4 out of 5 and can do impressive damage. He sends out a soul shadow that glides across the floor. Pressing the fire button again will cause it to explode, and the further away from you the soul is, the more damage it will do. Be careful though, if you are using the turbo boost when you fire it, the soul will explode on you. As far as why Mortimer is here, well, he has been hired by a group of souls to help them gain revenge on the person that cost them their lives. Yo dudes, it's like totally hammerhead next man. Mike and Stu are two clueless idiots looking for the ability to fly so they can see down women's shirts. They say so in a poem on the character called Selection Screen. So no mystery here as to what they want to wish for. Hammerhead, their vehicle of choice, is a cool looking monster truck. But sadly is nothing special stats wise. Sluggish handling, poor speed, average armour and special weapon. The special weapon itself is dull too, simply running over an opponent like a regular monster truck. And should you be against a vehicle that is bigger than you, or even just as big, well, it doesn't really seem to work. Captain Jamie Roberts is behind the wheel of Outlaw 2, a cop car that can cause some pretty decent damage, very good speed, decent handling and a good special weapon that should hopefully balance out the 2 out of 5 armour. The special weapon is a cool Omni Taser that shoots out like a bolt of electricity and spins around Outlaw 2 in order to cause damage to whoever happens to be within range, lifting the poor sods into the air and throwing them around. This particular special weapon can be a real pain to go up against if you happen to use a vehicle that requires being close to activate a special weapon, as more often than not Outlaw 2 will beat you to the punch and send you flying back. Captain Roberts is the sister of the original Outlaw driver from the first game who has disappeared ever since winning. Jamie needs to win so she can bring her brother back home. Next is Warthog, driven by the 105 year old war veteran Captain Rogers. I wonder if his first name is Steve. Anyway, given that he drives around in an army Humvee, his armour is an impressive 4 out of 5. He isn't very fast though and sluggish to handle, but his special weapon is 3 out of 5 and also homes in to the nearest opponent. The longer it takes the missiles to get to them, the more powerful they become. A very good special attack. Being 105 and obsessed with how old he is, I'm sure you can all guess what he wants to wish for should he win. 
Mr. Grimm is a mix between the Grim Reaper and Marvel's Ghost Rider, complete with motorbike and skull for a head. Mr. Grimm is a mixed bag, with the worst armour in the game, but also perhaps the strongest special weapon available, tight controls and fall out of 5 speed. You will need to be very careful using him, as his immense speed can often cause you to crash into things, which will take a chunk of your health away. Mr. Grimm is all about dem souls, and when he wins, he wants as many as he can get. Ever wanted to blow shit up in a dune buggy? Well, now you can! Krista Sparks is the driver of Grasshopper, which might be my least favourite vehicle in the entire game. Tight handling and 3 out of 5 speed is pretty much the only positives I can say about using Grasshopper. 1 out of 5 armour and a pitiful 2 out of 5 for a special weapon, which is terrible. You simply leap in the air and then slam into opponents and it does very little damage. This can also be interrupted if you're hit with another attack while attempting it. That being said, Grasshopper's ending is THE definitive ending in the game and in my opinion should be saved for last and not just because you'll need plenty of skill from playing the game with everyone else first in order to be able to actually beat it with her. Almost done now with the second to last character known as Bruce who drives Thumper. Thumper might be bright pink with only average handling, armour and speed but you do not want to mess with the 4 out of 5 special weapon which happens to be a flamethrower. This can cause major damage and any opponent unlucky enough to be set on fire with it can also set other opponents on fire should they touch them, causing even more damage overall. Bruce himself though is a fairly boring and generic character with a boring and generic ending. Still, it's always fun to set Carl on fire with a flamethrower. Last, we have Spectre, driven by the egotist Ken. Spectre is a cool looking sports car with impressive stats aside from having some of the boorest armour in the game. But with great speed and control you should be able to avoid taking too much damage and the special weapon happens to be a heat seeking ghost missile that will pass through walls to get to opponents and cause some serious damage. Win with Ken and see him finally get noticed by the world. So those are the 12 vehicles available to you from the start. But I did mention that there are two more that can only be a lot value cheat codes. So let's take a quick look at those. Minion seems to be the twisted metal equivalent of the devil. His story seems to heavily imply that Calypso stole his powers and now he's out for revenge. And oh boy can he get it. His huge tank like vehicle has the very best stats in the game. Well, for a car that you're able to use, with good handling, 4 out of 5 speed, and then 5 armour and 5 special weapon. You won't have much trouble beating the game with him. His special weapon rocks too. It's a more powerful version of the heat seeking missiles that Warthog has, which also become more powerful the longer you take to hit someone. And to add to that, it also shoots out an ice blast to freeze an opponent in place to make sure the missiles hit and to give you a few extra seconds to deal even more damage before they thaw out. You definitely feel invincible with Minion. Sweet Tooth is one hell of a creepy clown with a head of fire. He looks like a more demonic version of the clown in Stephen King's It. He drives an ice cream van of death and can give you nightmares of looking at him for too long. His speed is poor and handling is sluggish but he has very good armour and a solid special weapon. The special weapon shoots out a sort of ice cream cone missile which is more accurate when firing from a great distance. While only average damage it regenerates faster than other special weapons so it can be used more often. Play as him if you dare and be prepared for the unexpected with his ending. Once you've chosen your character, it's time to enter the Twister Metal Tournament and wreak havoc across the globe. The first location stays true to the first Twister Metal game as it sees you compete in LA once again. 
This is a good place to start as it features a pretty decent sized open space for you to get to grips with the game, but still has a few surprises in store for you, such as a flame pit and the the, the um the, the weird building that lets you use the lightning weapon. Oh, and if you see the Hollywood sign in the background, maybe take a couple of shots of it and see what happens. Location 2 sends you to Moscow in a sort of destruction derby 2 battle ball arena. Nowhere to run or hide here. Next location is Paris and oh boy is this level awesome. Now growing up in England for some reason it was just a thing to hate France. I, I don't know why. Maybe because we were forced to learn their language at school against our will? I, I don't know. Anyway, this level lets you destroy the Eiffel Tower. Visually, this level also has to be my favourite location too. Now, true, the graphics haven't really aged that well because it's a, a, a fairly early PlayStation 1 game, but I still love how it looks. The Eiffel Tower, the water, the streets, it just looks great to me. Also, really like how you can use the destruction of the Eiffel Tower to access the rooftops, adding even more to the level. Amazonia marks the halfway point and can be a very difficult level for faster vehicles. Walkways are thin and you're surrounded by lava, which will deplete your health if you drive into it. Again, there is more to this location than there seems, with a few hidden areas and secrets to be found. Once you've defeated your opponents here, you must face off against the final boss of the first game, Minion. Remember how I mentioned, not that long ago, just how invincible he is? Well, you find out real quick here. Depending on what difficulty setting you play the game on, you will either see a message telling you to play again on a harder difficulty, aka medium or hard, or you will continue on to New York. And rather than being down on the streets of New York, you are high in the air on the rooftops. This adds an extra level of difficulty as you must be careful not to drive off the edge and fall to your doom. On the other hand, it does give you an extra method of dispatching those pesky opponents. This location in particular probably has the most hidden areas to find and explore. So don't be too quick to kill everyone straight away. Should you survive falling to your death, then prepare to potentially fall into your death in Antarctica. Not only do you have to avoid falling off the edges, but now parts of the arena will quite literally sink as time goes on. If you see electricity on the floor and water shooting up into the air, move. I do enjoy freezing someone right as the section is about to sink though, definitely one of the more fun ways in the game to take care of an opponent. Explore this location if you dare. The second to last location moves you to Holland. This will really test you as you are stuck inside a rectangular field against nine other vehicles, with only two windmills to try and hide in until they get blown up. This is truly an all-out war, with someone constantly trying to destroy you from all sides. Finally, we have Hong Kong. Ride down the streets of Hong Kong, maybe visit the harbour, or hide out in the underground railway system that runs around the arena. For the final location, things don't really seem too bad here. Until you beat everyone, that is. Just when you think you've won the Twisted Metal contest, out comes Darktooth, the father of Sweet Tooth. Remember when I said that Minion was basically invincible and has the best stats in the game that you can play as? Well, the vehicle that truly has the best stats in the game is Darktooth. His gigantic, towering vehicle has perfect stats all around. Now, the PlayStation version, you cannot play as him. Well, you kind of can using a Game Shark thing, but it's really buggy and can crash your game and even you know, ruin your memory card. So, not advised to do that. 
There was a PC port of the game which did have Dark Tooth as an unlockable character, but it's best to avoid playing the PC game because it was terrible. This fight with Dark Tooth will really test you. Like I said, he has full 5 out of 5 stats for everything, and his special weapon is insanely powerful. However, you will feel incredible when you finally beat him. Only to be thrown back into another bloody fight with him. Second time around though, he's much easier as he's just a, a floating head, and it is incredibly weak to fire, which makes no sense because the head's on fire to be in them. Dispatch him as quick as possible and you can now claim your prize from Calypso. As previously mentioned, each character has their own ending. So with the two secret characters it can unlock, there are 14 different endings that you can get in this game. And despite being playing for almost 20 years now, these never get boring. There is unlimited replay value here for me. And the fact that it will probably take you roughly an hour to beat each character, you know, there's 14 hours of main gameplay here. 14 hours. That's more than quite a lot of big AAA titles we get today. Yeah, so the endings, I'm not going to spoil them for you. You just need to play this game, play the game, see all the endings. But I will tell you that Calypso, when he grants the wishes, you have to be very careful what you say because he will take your wish, literally. Yeah, so there is something of a catch to your know, prize, which can result in some pretty hilarious outcomes. So please play the game with everyone and see all of the endings and make sure you play as Grasshopper last. Well, that's what happens when you beat the game. Now I've gone over the levels, gone over the characters. How do you beat the game on each level with each character? You have to use the weapons of course, let's talk about those. Aside from the unique special weapon that each car has, there are weapon pickups scattered about in each level for you to pick up and use. These are... Fire Missile! One of the weak weapons, but it does have a little bit of a homing ability if you don't fire it too far away from an enemy. Homing Missile! Pretty weak, but it does do a good job of homing in on opponents. Power Missile! Very powerful, hence the name, but you must be 100% accurate when firing. Ricochet Bomb. This bomb bounces off of walls until it hits a vehicle or something destructible. The longer it bounces around, the more powerful it becomes. Lightning. This will strike opponents down with a lightning bolt, but can only be used in very specific locations in specific levels. Napalm. Launch a ball of fire that can set other things on fire. Chocking, right? Remote Bomb. The strongest pickup weapon available. Drop the bomb and then remotely detonate it any time you wish. Be wary though, it can hurt you too. And the final pickups aren't exactly weapons, but are certainly very useful. First is a health pickup, and the second is a turbo pickup. I think you can guess what they do. Controlling your vehicle of death here is pretty simple. Holding square to drive, direction pad to move about, circle as you brake, holding the triangle button will give you a turbo boost, L1 and R1 will cycle through weapons, Holding down L2 will fire a constant minigun, which does terrible damage, but it's there just to help out. And if you press R2, you'll fire whichever weapon you currently have selected. It couldn't be more simple, really. Now, you may have noticed that there is another bar on the screen above your selected weapon. This isn't a second health bar, as much as you might wish it was at times, but instead an advanced attack energy bar, 
with a few directional button combinations you can pull off a few attacks and maneuvers, such as a freeze ray, high jump and backwards fire. These are just some of the ones the game manual tells you, but there are many more to discover, such as invisibility, energy shield, napalm and more. These are very useful when you don't have any weapons left, and the energy meter does slowly refill. There are some other small things that I just want to mention too. Holding the select button and then pressing a the direction will change how things look. You can zoom out to an almost overhead view, which is my personal preference when playing, as you can see all around. If you want to keep the normal view, a mirror can be added to the screen so you can see behind. To increase the difficulty, you can remove the radar should you want, and finally, you can bring up the weapons hood, which will list all of the weapons and how many are available, rather than only seeing them one at a time when you cycle through with the L and R1 buttons. These features add some nice, albeit basic, customization to the screen when playing, and it's just nice little additions to the game. The last thing I want to talk about are the different modes. You have the tournament mode, where you play through each level and try to win the ultimate prize. Challenge match, where you can select which level you wish to play in and who you would like to battle against. Lastly, the multiplayer mode. Yep, a game like this would be insane not to include multiplayer. You can battle each other in one on one challenge match mode, which also happens to include three exclusive multiplayer maps that can only be accessed via cheat codes, or you can team up together in tournament mode. Between single player and multiplayer, this game is never ending fun. Whew, okay, I think I've covered everything now. So, let's get to my final thoughts and the score. Like I said, I've been playing this for almost 20 years and I've never gotten bored with it. There's never been a time where I put it in and I started to play and thought to myself, yeah, I don't really feel like playing this anymore. It's one of those games like Super Mario World, which is my all-time favourite game. It's the only game I would put ahead of this in terms of my favourite. I've been playing that since I was a kid and I just never get bored with it. And the same is, can be said for this. You've got the 14 different vehicles and characters, all unique, all crazy. They all have some sort of positive to them, be it the car that they're driving looking cool, the special weapon being amazing, or their price being hilarious to see. You have all the different weapons that you can use, ranging from homing missiles to power missiles to ricochet bombs, remote bombs, and of course the unique special weapons which I adore. The levels, you know, the, I think eight levels in the game, and then the three that you can use via cheat codes for multiplayer. There's just so much variety in it for such an old game. The graphics, they, they don't really hold up well. I understand that, but I still like them. I, I do. I don't play the game and think, boy, this looks like shit. It might just be, you know, the old uh, nostalgia goggles on, but. I still love the way the game looks, I do, especially the cutscenes. Um, the, I think the first game had live action, really cheesy ones, but this one doesn't have live action, it's uh, sort of you know, paper uh, cut out things and there's not much animation to them. It, it's got its own style and I just really, really like the way it's done, I do. One thing that I haven't talked about yet is the soundtrack, holy fuck the soundtrack. The main theme for starters is incredible. Um, hopefully, um, I'll upload this video first, uh, keep it private, and if I get a copyright strike on it, I'll have to remove music. If not, uh, throughout the video you will have heard some uh, themes from the Twisted Metal game in the background. Each level has its own unique, distinct theme, and especially like the one in Paris, it has sort of a French tune, that you might recognise, a sort of remix to be, you know, fitting more with the Twisted Metal game. Like I said, each level's got a great theme to it, and Twisted Metal 2 also happens to be one of the handful of PlayStation 1 games that, when you were to put into a CD player or just a PC, you can play it as an audio CD, and it's got the soundtrack on it. 
which I of course have ripped and put onto my PC because it's great to listen to and that's how hopefully I'll be using it in the background for some of the video clips here. So yeah, it still looks great to me at least. I like the visual style of it. It sounds great. Tons of characters, great vehicles, plenty of weapons, cool locations, 14 different endings, awesome multiplayer mode and just never ending replay value to me. It's my second favourite game of all time and my absolute favourite game for the PlayStation 1. Well, the Twisted Metal series, you know, the franchise has really had its ups and downs. When it's been up, it's been at this level. This is, in my opinion, the best game of the entire franchise. It's incredible. And it almost kind of makes up for some of the other games being shit, because who cares if they're shit when this exists, you know? So, for my score, my score, I'm giving Twisted Metal World Tour the Sony PlayStation 1 a monstrously massive, amazing 95 out of 100. The only thing is that, you know, yeah, the graphics can look pretty bad by today's standards, and I can't give it a 100 out of 100 because, you know, it's not really a perfect game. There are a few issues with certain vehicles with the driving, for example, if you're going too fast, um, any little bump in the map and you're just you're flying in the air and just keep on going, and it can be very difficult to steer sometimes. But there's not really much I can say wrong about it, but it, I still don't think it's a 100 out of 100 absolutely perfect game, if that makes any sense. But it gets 95 out of 100, which is a huge score. One of the best games I've ever played, as well as being one of my favourites. That is Twisted Metal 2 World Tour on the Sony PlayStation 1. Getting it over in America, things like that should be fairly easy because it is not that expensive. Over here in the UK, um, you are looking to pay about £40, which is probably what it would have cost back in the day. Or, you could simply get it in the PS3 store, and um, cost like $3.99 or something, or you can usually get it in a sale. So definitely pick it up. Please pick it up, play through the entire game, every character, see all the endings, and I just hope you fall in love with this game as much as I have. Well, I'm Big Cal, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.